Praise the Lord, church family. I welcome you to the Wake Eden Community Baptist Church live worship experience. Uh, we are so glad that you are here this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are rejoicing and being glad in it. The Lord has given us a new day. Uh, the Word of God tells us that His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. And so we rejoice because of who God is. Things around us are not the best right now. Things are chaotic in so many ways, and we'll talk about a little bit of that later. But because of who you are, we give God glory. Because of who you are, God, we give you praise. Because of who you are, we lift our voice and say, Lord, we worship you because of who you are. And we've gathered this morning to do just that. So I invite you and ask that you would reach out to other members and friends and neighbors, family members. Just reach out to them and let them know that worship has begun. Encourage them to come on and be a part of our worship experience right now. Please indicate that you are on. Just write a comment as we go through the service. Uh, we have uh, some of our leaders on the line, on, on the, on the um, uh, who are online, who will uh, greet you and who will respond to you uh, during, during the uh, worship experience. So uh, Psalm, Psalm 24, verses 1 through 5, it states, The earth is the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into his to, into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his heart, his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. You know, today is Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we celebrate uh, Pentecost. It is the day when we, when we remember and recognize the descending of the Holy Spirit upon a body of believers, 120 souls in all, of men and women who had gathered for prayer, and the Spirit of God filled them with power and courage, and they went out boldly to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He has risen from the dead, and He has accomplished redemption for humanity. Uh, this early church was... Uh, was empowered and filled with the Spirit like never before. And this group of people went and turned the world upside down, spreading the gospel of the kingdom of God. And this is just an amazing uh, story, experience to reflect on as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday today and to know that the same Holy Spirit is with us today. And we're going to be talking about that later on in our service. But I welcome you. Uh, please uh, enjoy praise and worship as we welcome Brother Mark, Sister, uh, Sister Diane, and Brother Nathaniel as they lead us in praise and worship. Morning, Wake Eden family and friends. So good to join again with you this week. Join us as we worship in the singing of these lovely praise songs. Trust your heart and soul might be blessed.
Waking Church fam and all of our Waking Church friends out there, thank you all so much for joining us during our online worship session. We pray that you are receiving a blessing and we also pray that you and your loved ones are doing well and staying healthy. So God calls us to worship through giving and even in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, the Bible talks about the importance of giving and giving with our whole hearts, not because we feel forced or because we feel guilty, but because God truly does love a cheerful giver. So if you would like to give and you're feeling led, I just wanted to share with you a few ways in which you can give. So there are three ways in which you can give online. And the first way is by visiting our website, which is wakeeden.org. Once you get on the website, you will see three tabs on the top right. The first one is an About Us tab. The second one is a Connect tab. And the third is a Give tab. Once you click on the Give tab, you will see a little button that says Give, and that will direct you to a secure website in which you can give using your debit or credit card. The second way that you can give is by taking out your smartphone and texting the word Give to 833-714-0655. Once you text the word Give to that number, it will send you a link with more information on how to give. And finally, you can mail in your gift by sending a check addressed to Wake Eden Community Baptist Church to the attention of the finance department. And the address to Wake Eden Community Baptist Church is 2074 Strang Avenue, Bronx, New York, 10466. All the links that I mentioned will pop up somewhere on the page, so be sure to check it out, give as you feel led, and we want to thank you again so much for your giving and for your prayers. And let's all just continue to pray for each other during this time. Be well and be blessed.
chapter 2. We're going to read from verses 1 uh, through 13. Then I'm going to make a few comments and then we're going to dive right into our, our, our message for this morning. And uh, the message is entitled, When the Fire Falls. When the Fire Falls. And we'll be talking about the person and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The person and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, and the scripture reads, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused 
because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these Galileans who speak? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which, in which we were born? Parthens and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we commit this time into your hands, asking that by your Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, help us to, to understand, to see, to hear God what you would have us to. We pray, Spirit of God, that you will do what only you can do. I need you, Holy Spirit. Would you lead this time, I pray, for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You know, um, before we get into the meat of our text, we are again experiencing the blood of injustice crying out from the ground. The recent deaths of Ahmad Arbery and George Floyd and the nonviolent but very disturbing incident in Central Park between uh, a black male bird watcher and a white female walking her unleashed dog um, has all added to the fuel of racism and the fire of racism that has never gone out in this country. Racism, racial bias, racial profiling, racial discrimination, race-based disparities uh, have, have long been well documented and it has a horrific history in this country as it pertains to black people and people of color. These, these, are, those, these are those instances in our country that, that, that we look back upon and, and, and we, 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 we shake our heads in, in disbelief uh, that this still continues today in the 21st century. Um, now, you know, there are those condemning the rioting, the looting, and the destruction of property, saying that this only serves to distract from the matter at hand, you know, that which is the unjust and inhumane killing of George uh, Floyd. Um, and, 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 that is, and that is true. Uh, but, you know, until justice is justice for all, we will see this kind of outrage. And it is rage. And when rage is ignited, anything is possible. The fire of indignation burns in the veins of, of those whose hearts understand what it means to live with the constant threat of the potential of complexion-based bias. Yes, I would agree. Don't loot. It looks like a self-centered opportunistic act that is indicative of a materialistic culture. Just trying to go after stuff because the opportunity presents itself. But it could also be a demonstration of people trying to get what they have been economically shut out from acquiring. Either way, it does break the law. But if that disturbs you more than the loss of these men's lives, then you need to pray. You need to you need to pray. Um, we, we hope 
and pray as protests continue that there will be more peaceful demonstrations of our outrage that will help push our justice systems, our health care systems, and other systems where they are disparities that are based on racial bias, that it will push those systems further toward equality, which is what is needed to rid society of these kinds of instances that are race-based reactions uh, to, um, uh, to, to instances uh, that, that are so tragic that we, we, we can't stay silent. You know, um, and so cities are burning right now. Buildings are burning down <clears throat> right now because people are outraged. But today, I want to talk about another fire. I want to talk about a fire that John the Baptist said would come. And he's speaking of Jesus. He says in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, that there's one coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this instance of this baptism is what is taking place in Acts chapter 2. Clark Pinnock, in his book on the Holy Spirit entitled, entitled Flame of Love, he writes, People want to meet the real and living God and will not be satisfied with a religion that only preaches and moralizes. He concludes, only by attending to the Spirit can we move beyond sterile, rationalistic religion in the direction of recovering the sense of intimacy and immediacy for which our generation and every generation longs. End of quote. We long to know God deeply. The routines of religious practice, although important, seem to do nothing to inspire us into a deeper experience with God. I submit to you that oftentimes it is these very routines that precede a mighty move of God's Spirit. That although sometimes they feel, they feel um, lifeless or they may feel um, like, like just a, a, a ritual of some kind that has lost its meaning for you. The discipline of practicing prayer and practicing scriptural engagement and spiritual engagements, it readies us for an encounter with God. So I invite you to think with me about this group of disciples, 120 persons, we are told in Acts chapter 1, verse 15, right, who have gathered to pray. This group of people, within the span of 52 days, they have experienced the crucifixion of Jesus, the miraculous resurrection of Jesus, the post-resurrection experience appearances of Christ and the experiences that, that accompany that. They experienced Jesus ascended, ascending into the clouds and, 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 and out of the range of their sight. And now they were told to go and to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a moment. In today's message... When the fire falls, we'll focus on the person of the Holy Spirit and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. So, so the person of the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit equal with God? Is the Holy Spirit God? We are first introduced to the Holy Spirit, to the Spirit of God in Genesis chapter 1. And it reads, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
So here in this opening verses of the Bible, we see that there is this collaborative work between God, Elohim, who speaks, and the Spirit of God, who in this passage was just hovering over the face of the waters. And it would appear that when God spoke, the Spirit activated and did what was spoken and caused it to become. Right? That the Spirit of God was actively at work in the creative process. We would learn later on, so was Jesus. Right? We would learn that in, in, in the Gospel of John uh, chapter, chapter 1. So we see this collaborative work from the very beginning in Genesis uh, chapter 1. In fact, when you, when, you, when you look down in Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1, and you, and you look at uh, verse, verse 26, um, you, 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 you see these, these words. And, and, it's, and, 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 and if you're not careful, you will, you, will, you will read right over them. It says, let us make man in our own image. Let us, right? Us. And God is the one that's, that's being quoted here. So who is the us, right? You, you know, the other day I was in, um, my son was doing some homework and he came to me with that very question. And he says, Dad, you know, I, I, I was reading Genesis chapter 1 and I, and I see it says, let us make man in our image. And he asked me the question, who is the us that's being referenced here? Isn't it God who is speaking? But well, who is with God if, if he hasn't made man? He said, is it the angels that's with him? And we had a good conversation about that, a, a question and answer conversation that, that, would lead, that led to the conclusion that God was speaking about God's self, right? And, and so, and, 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 and so, when you, when, when you speak of God, we are really speaking of God as God is. As God is. Right? That, that, that is the very nature and the very substance of God's self. That, that in, 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 the, in, in, in the existence of God, there is a spiritual substance that makes up who God is. You know, the Bible says that God is spirit, right? But, but his spirit has substance. It has body form of some kind that we do not know what that is. But it is a spiritual matter that makes up God's presence. And it is an eternal substance. It has no beginning. It has no end. So when we speak of God, we are speaking of God as God is. You know, so, so, we, so when you speak of God, there is that aspect of God. God in his organic form. God as God was from eternity to eternity. God always is, never had a beginning, will never have an end, always existed, pre-exist everything. The creator, the manufacturer, the founder, the maker, the establisher of all things alive or inanimate, God is the cause of its existence. But God himself has no cause. He is the uncaused cause of everything else. And when you speak of God, we speak of that very substance of who God is. But when we speak of God, we also speak of God in terms of how God functions, right? Which is a very different aspect, right? So when you look at scripture, we see that God, as God reveals himself to humanity, as people get to know God, they begin to ascribe certain adjectives to describe God, attributes, we would say. Right? So Hagar, when she encounters God in her, in, in her wilderness experience where she felt that she and her son were about to die in the wilderness when they were, when, when they were forced out of their home, with Abraham and Sarah, she encounters God in the wilderness and she says, you are the God who sees. 
You saw me in my plight and you responded to my need and my crisis. You are the God who sees. So people begin to, to identify God based on their encounters with God. If you look at Moses, when Moses encounters God and when God is calling Moses to return to Egypt to deliver his fellow Hebrew people from bondage and enslavement in Egypt, Moses asked God, who shall I say sent me? What is your name? And God's response was, I am that I am. Whatever I am is what I am. Tell them I am sent you. Right? So, so God is slowly either disclosing him himself to us in, in terms of language and identity or people are ascribing adjectives and attributes to God based on their experiences. David can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my provider. He is Jehovah Jireh because he provided for me at my point in need. So, so they are experiencing God and they are calling God based on, 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 on how they have experienced God. So we see here, that, that there are these, these, these functions of God in addition to the very nature and substance of God. One of the most prominent ones that we see in the pages of Scripture is found in the New Testament where God reveals himself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right? These are all ways that God has chosen to reveal God's self to us. That these roles are self-imposed by God, manifested for our redemptive benefit, right? And so the Holy Spirit is a part of that. And so the question is, is the Holy Spirit equally God? Well, the question here has to be answered not so much based on the role of the Holy Spirit, but based on the substance of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and so to understand this, if you only look at the role, you may begin to think, well, the, the, the Holy Spirit seems to have a, a lesser role or a different role than the Father, a different role than Jesus. And you begin to try and figure out, well, which one is more important? Are they equal in power, authority, and so forth? Well, well, well you know, we, we can spend a quite a bit of time trying to figure out whether, whether one will consider the Holy Spirit as, as equal with God or equal with God the Father. But the, 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 the quickest way to that conclusion is to determine, well, where does the Holy Spirit come from? Is the Holy Spirit created or did the Holy Spirit always exist? Well, the scriptures tell us in John chapter um, John chapter 15, verse 26 through 27, that the Holy Spirit proceeds forth from the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds forth from the Father. In fact, in, in John chapter 16, uh, verse 28, Jesus says the same thing of himself, that I proceeded forth from the Father. So the scripture reads, and Jesus speaks, he says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the very beginning. Jesus uses the same language to describe himself. In fact, if you're familiar with the Gospels, you will know that Jesus, in response to um, to, to one of his audiences, he, he said to them, before Abraham was, I am. And he's speaking to a group of Pharisees at that point, religious leaders. And so, so he's indicating to them that my existence precedes the existence of Abraham. And they responded to Jesus facetiously and, and sarcastically. You're not even 50 years old yet. Come on, Abraham lived thousands of years ago, right? But what Jesus is doing here, he's saying, look, just because I was born uh, through Mary does not mean I began to exist at that point. 
Jesus is indicating to them that my existence long precedes Abraham. In fact, Jesus went on to say that I and the Father are one. Jesus saying that he is one with the Father, that he proceeded forth from God the Father. This is an indication that Jesus shares the same organic substance as God. Regardless of the manifested role of Christ in the flesh, it means that before that manifestation, Jesus existed and his substance was the same eternal substance as God. And the Holy Spirit as well shares the same eternal substance. That they were not subsequent creations of God. They were not the first creations of God. No, they are God. The same eternal substance that God, Elohim, Adonai has is the same eternal substance of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Regardless of their roles that they have determined to have for the benefit of human redemption. Is the Holy Spirit equal with the Father and the Son? Yes. Why? Because you must answer the question, what makes God God? Is it substance or is it function? You begin with substance and then function is whatever God has chosen to manifest. Right? In fact, Jesus alluded to some things that the Father has in his own authority. We saw that last week, right? When you, when, when you read through Acts chapter 1, when Minister Alvin preached. You know, why are you worried about things that the Father has put in his own authority? And Jesus has also said that in other parts of the gospel as, as well. No one knows this except the Father who has put this in his own authority. That means that there's something that Jesus didn't know. Well, however God chooses to collaborate between the Godhead is up to God. That, that collaborative roles that God has cho chosen to implement is God's choice. But in terms of the organic substance, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equally God. Because that organic substance that eternal substance, that material that makes up God is the same material that makes up the Son and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the same substance as God's self, eternally. Emerging from the very substance of God means that the Spirit existed eternally as God and was not created as a lesser being. There are no hierarchical structure in terms of equality within God. Father, Son, and Spirit are self-imposed, self-disclosed manifestations of God to us. The Spirit is eternal. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Did you hear this? How much more shall the blood of Christ, the Son of God, who through the eternal Spirit, the Spirit of God, offered himself without spot to God, God the Father, to cleanse us from a dead works that we may serve the living God, Father, Son, and Spirit together. One. So you mean to tell me that God, through God, offered God to God, that he might cleanse us from our dead works that we might serve God. Yes. <laughs> There's a mystery here, right? That God, through his manifestation of himself as the Son, shed the blood, shed his blood through the person of Jesus Christ, through the eternal spirit, offered himself to the Father that he might cleanse us, that we might serve them. Him. God. One. There's a mystery here. But look at what this says to us. It says that we were in such a predicament that only God could make the sacrifice that could, that could satisfy God's requirement for us that we might adequately serve God. So God needed God in order to correct what God needed corrected. Isn't it amazing how God has committed himself to humanity in this way? That's an amazing commitment. That's an amazing act 
of, of, of love and faithfulness to us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your indescribable gift through Jesus Christ, your Son. So the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit has been given as a gift into this world to help humanity come to the knowledge of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He has special assignments to the body of Christ, the church. Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 7, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. The Spirit will help you. He will comfort you. He will guide you into all truth, the Spirit of truth. Hearing Jesus use these words to describe the intents of the Holy Spirit, whom he calls the helper, lets us know that God has reached out to humanity to rescue us from our sinfulness and to also rescue us from the influences of demonic forces. That God's intentions towards us are good. They are, they are for our best. It is to give us a hope and to give us a future. God's intentions in your life are never to hurt you. They are to help you. They are never to oppress you. They are to liberate you. They are never to condemn you. They are to forgive you. And so Father, Son, and Spirit have, have developed and implemented a collaborative work, a plan through the ages that we might be able to find God, that we might be able to connect with God, and we might be able to know God personally. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for such love. Thank you for such grace. So I want to move on from the person of the Holy Spirit now to the purpose of the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, we are told, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 13, that the Holy Spirit is a teacher, right? The Holy Spirit teaches us. So I want to read verse 13 for you, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, uh, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So the Holy Spirit teaches us, right? Uh, the, the Holy Spirit comforts us. John chapter 14, verse 16 through 18, the Holy Spirit is not just a helper, but he's also called the comforter. It implies that we would have those kinds of experiences in life where we would either be grieved or we will be um, tragically wounded us in, in some way, shape, or form that we would need the kind of comfort that comes from God, our Creator. And He has sent the Holy Spirit to be a comforter. But the Holy Spirit is also a guide. You know, John chapter 16, verse 13 to 15, that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will tell you things to come, that there are times where the Holy Spirit reveals things to us. You get an intuition, you get... A, a, a word of knowledge, you get, you, you get an insight, a gut feeling. These are all ways, sometimes a discernment that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Have you ever had those experiences in your life where you look back and you realize you were being guided by the Holy Spirit, but you may not even have known it at the time, right? You, 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 you had an inclination in your thoughts, in your heart. You don't know where it came from. It didn't even quite make sense in that moment, but it came and you went with it. And because you went with it, it went well with you, right? That was, that, that, that was the Spirit of God just nudging you, the Spirit of God just revealing something to you. And you went with it, although you didn't understand all of it. And it was the grace of the Holy Spirit guiding you at that point, in that moment, or in that season of your life. Somebody say glory to God. But the Holy Spirit also convicts us. John chapter 16, verse 8. You know, it, it tells us that one of the works of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Wow! Now, this is the kind of stuff that we don't normally like to, to consider, right? Sin, righteousness, and judgment, that the Holy Spirit is going to convict me of these things. I've had those moments 
That's how I even came to Christ. The Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. And even as a Christian, whenever there was a sin issue in my life, that the Spirit of God says, no, Frank, and he convicts you of that. And, and he says, you need to repent. You need to do better than that. You need to not go there. You need to not be a part of this. The Spirit of God convicts us of sin, righteousness. and He's letting us know what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Now, what's important to understand here is that the convicting work of the Holy Spirit is not to shame you or to leave you in condemning guilt. No, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the enemy of our souls do that. He will leave you in a place of depression and, and self-loathing where you feel so unworthy, you feel so, 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 so so guilty, you, 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 you feel so, so deeply disappointed, whether it's in yourself or in others, that you find yourself stuck in a place of unforgiveness, not forgiving yourself, unable to forgive uh, someone else, and you just find yourself living in that wounded place. And it takes time to get out of that, whether it's through a process of of, of, of maturing or through a process where you're speaking to someone and, and you're getting the right kind of counsel through that moment in your life. But you need to know that when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, it is to lift you out, not oppress you in. The Spirit of God has come that he may lift us from these dark places and from these, these forces of of. of, of, of uh, of the kingdom of darkness that will seek to keep us trapped in those places that displease God. Come on, if you're in some places in your life where you know, you know what, God, I know, God, you're not pleased with this. The Spirit of God is going to make you feel. He's going to use your conscience. You're going to feel guilty about that. You're going to feel, you're going to feel the conviction of the Spirit that you need to change that in your life. And my recommendation to you is to always repent. I, you, myself, always repent and move towards God. That's always the best decision to make. But he convicts us of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. But the Holy Spirit also appoints. He appoints. Acts chapter 13 verse 2 tells us of when they appointed people to go out uh, into the world to preach. To go out into society to preach. In fact, in Acts chapter 13, um, it, it, it speaks about that time when they fasted and prayed. And then they laid hands on Barnabas and Paul to go out and to be witnesses, right? Uh, and, and to preach the gospel and to spread the gospel. And it says there that, that, that they were sent away, right? Look at that. Verse 2, as they ministered and, and to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit is, 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 is speaking through impressions and speaking uh, through a process of discernment. And they are talking to each other and God is using their voices uh, to, to be his instruments to communicate. His will. And the Spirit of God says separate these. So the Holy Spirit speaks to us. He speaks to us, right? He appoints. The Holy Spirit also empowers. He empowers. And we see that empowerment happening as in Acts chapter 2. This was an empowering moment. This empowerment, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 is twofold. It is actually the inauguration or the initiation of this group of people as the body of Christ, as the church. This was the church's initial service. It was commissioned uh, to be his church. It was established. It was constituted. Whatever word you may want to use there. This outpouring in Acts chapter 2 was God laying his hand on this group of people and saying to the entire world and all of history, I have established my church and I have blessed this group of people and the larger body of Christ historically to be the bearers of my presence in this earth. Wow, what an amazing, amazing thought. And so whenever someone gets saved, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit into the church. That it is that form of an experience. But that's only one aspect of it. 
The second aspect of it, that it was a personal baptism as well in the Holy Spirit. That there was not just this inauguration, but there was this immersion personally in the presence and person of the Holy Spirit. That each of them individually had an encounter with God that was empowering. In fact, the text said that there was a flame of fire that rested upon them, representing the Holy Spirit. That the fire of heaven fell upon these men and women and it sat upon them and they were emboldened the fear that they felt dissipated it went away and they became fearless that that these people who were a bit timid because of the trouble that they that they had that they had been experiencing because of the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ they they were now triumphant they began to feel the kind of confidence and boldness to share the gospel like they never experienced prior to that moment because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the text says that the gift of tongues manifested. There was this, there was this corporate manifestation of speaking in, in other, other languages that was a miraculous occurrence, not just for their utterance, but also for those who eventually heard these utterances in their own native languages. Wow, there was a double miracle happening there. A miracle of speaking in other languages in tongues and the miracle of hearing those words in their own native languages. These, this was a, a, an awesome work of the Holy Spirit that occurred on this occasion. So the Holy Spirit also empowers us and that same empowerment that happens there, that happened there in the book of Acts is also available to us. Now, I want to make a distinction here in the filling of the Holy Spirit, just like I did with the baptism, that, you know, that there are three ways of understanding the Holy, the filling of the Holy Spirit, right? That the Holy Spirit um, fills you by virtue of the fact that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that the Spirit of God comes and dwells within you, fills you, fills you uh, on the inside. You, you know, this is, a, this is similar to what happened in John chapter 20 where Jesus appears to them for the first time and he breathes upon them and says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And they received the blessing of the presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling them in that moment. And then, of course, you have the gradual experience of being filled with the fullness of God. Paul the Apostle speaks about that in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2. And, and he says, I'm praying for you that the Lord may, may, may do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And, and that implies that there, that there is a gradual filling, that there is a maturing. You know, Paul the Apostle, I like the way he describes us when we are younger in Christ. He says, you are babes, Right? And we desire the sincere milk of the word. But as time goes on, we are ready for some solid food. We want to dig into some teachings. We want to dig into deeper understandings. We want God to use us in, 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 in ways that, 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 that exceeds um, our own limitations. Right? God take over. Right? That there is a filling of God that happens gradually. I hope that, that the longer you are in Christ, that you are seeing that you are actually growing in your faith. That you are steady growing in your relationship with God. The more time that goes on, you want your relationship with God. Just like you would with a significant other in your life, a spouse, a, 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 a relative of some kind, a good friend. You want your relationship to always Get deeper, all right, to be more significant. Well, God wants the same in our relationship with him. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, God desires to fill us more and more through the course of time. But there's also the filling of the Holy Spirit that is an experience. It is an experience. It comes upon you like, 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 uh, like a mighty rushing wind, as this text describes 
and you feel this saturation with the presence of God. I, rem I, I know those times in my life's journey where I have experienced being saturated in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I feel the presence of the Spirit filling me on the inside that there is a physical response. There is a physical experience to that where the Spirit of God is upon you, indwelling you, and you experience this happening. And it's just an amazing Amazing, transforming experience and encounter with the Holy Spirit. All right? So what I'm saying here is all three, we find all three within the pages of Scripture. Right? That initial filling that everybody receives. Then there's that, there's that gradual filling that happens as we grow and mature. And there are these experiences where you are saturated with the Holy Spirit and he does a tr quick transformational work in your life in that moment. All of these are works of the Holy Spirit, purposes of the Holy Spirit. Certainly the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Romans chapter 8 verse 26, he gives gifts to the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, he regenerates us. Titus chapter 3 verse 5, right? That's where he takes our spirit that's far from God. The Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sins, and he regenerates us. He gives us new life on the, on the inside. But the Holy Spirit also anoints us. Now, the word anoint is interesting. It means to smear or to rub with a substance, and it's usually oil, right? Until that object is covered or permeated with that. With it, all right. So to anoint, uh, to be anointed by the Holy Spirit is to be smeared. That means that that the Holy Spirit is upon you in a special way. So, so Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The apostles were anointed by the Holy Spirit. You might be anointed by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, though? What it means is that that the Holy Spirit gives you a particular empowerment. For a particular kind of gift or ministry or work or service or even occupation. You are anointed for that. It means that God has given you a special grace to do that. So while the entire church can be empowered, there are people within the church now, right, who have different anointings. There are some that, man, when they sing, that anointing comes, and it's like, wow, it takes them beyond their own natural voice and talents. Some, when they're teaching, the anointing comes, and there's something about their simple word that comes alive, that there is a grace and an anointing there for that. They may do other things well, but you don't sense that same anointing there because when they are operating in that lane where the Holy Spirit has anointed them for that, that anointing activates and, and, and the impact of that, the effect of that upon others is, is just beyond what it would be in that person's own natural ability because they are anointed by the Holy Spirit. For that, and this can be for things that are done within the church. It could be it, it could be anointings that impact uh, people in terms of their their reach in, in, uh, beyond the walls of the church. Even even in your job, you can be anointed for certain things. In fact, the Bible says that I will anoint you with the oil of gladness. It could just be your disposition. You walk in, and everybody is cheering up because you have entered the space. You have been anointed with the oil of gladness. You just have a way of cheering people up and it may seem natural to you maybe you were always that way but when you came to Christ the spirit of God smeared you with an anointing that enables you to bring joy to other people without even it being an effort it just exudes from you you have an anointing for that right so the Holy Spirit also anoints us but, but it's important to note that, 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 that all of these persons that the Holy Spirit anointed in Acts chapter 2, these were just ordinary men and women. They were people like you and I. All right? They were people just like you and I. They, they had their own experiences that were common to the human experience. They were just... Like us, different culture, different time in history, but they were human beings and all shared the same basic challenges 
fears, and experiences of being human. Just like you and I. In fact, if you were to read Acts chapter 6, right? Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 12, Galatians chapter 2, um, James chapter 2, you would all find passages where the, the, the different um, issues that they were dealing with were coming up. Acts chapter 6, uh, the widows of the Hebrews, the Jewish folks, and the widows of the Hellenists, the Greek folks, they were not being treated equally. There was a disparity among them that the Hebrew widows were getting their daily distribution, but the, the, the widows of the Hellenists were being neglected, the scripture says. And, and, and that means that there was something wrong in their system that needed to be checked. And, and, and that's when they appointed the, you know, this, this group of seven men and said, you know what, see to it to make sure that equity is happening here, that there's an equality among the people and that there isn't favoritism going on here, right? Cultural bias is going on here. And, 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 and it was because we see a similar, a similar situation in, in, in Acts chapter 10 when God had to convince Peter to go to the house of a Gentile man named Cornelius. He was a Roman. And he had to convince Peter through a vision to go to Cornelius' house. And when Peter enters, his first words were, you know, it's unlawful for me to even step foot into your house. Wow. Talk about shade, right? Talk about saying to Cornelius, I should not even be in your house because I will be ceremonially, ceremonially unclean for stepping foot into your house. Now, if somebody walks into your house and those are their first words, that's an offense. Right? But Cornelius had a vision too. And so he knew Peter should be there. And so they were putting away their own cultural biases in order to facilitate what God wanted to accomplish. Come on now. Come on now. But Peter, it still lingered with Peter because in Galatians chapter 2, Paul the apostle had to now correct Peter because when, 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 when certain Jewish prominent leaders would come, Peter would act like he didn't know certain people. And he would only hang out with those people. And he wouldn't go with the Gentiles. But when those leaders would leave, Peter would then go and hang out with the other Gentiles as well. And Paul the Apostle observed it from a distance and he called Peter out on it. What was that? It was ethnic bias. You know, Peter was practicing a form of the gospel that was not pleasing to God. It was really sin. Right? And, and of course, in, in James, James, James in chapter 2 talks about the economic disparities of how we treated people, how they treated people differently based on their wealth. So there was this wealth gap in the church. You had some that were prominent and others who were poor. And those who were prominent were always given the best seats and given the best attention and given the best customer service. And those who were poor were not treated with the same level of respect. And James had to put a stop to it. And he spoke to them about it. All of this was within the church, you know, and, and it's sin. You, you see, I would want to say, you know, even as we look at the situation that's going on in our nation right now, the racial injustice, the ethnic, the ethnic profiling, the, all of all of this, the forms of discrimination and disparities that are going on. You know, I would want to say that the church has the answer. Or at least the right content to help us deal with these realities. But the truth is the church has been guilty of its own forms of racial and social injustice. Church has been guilty of its own immoralities. If we are honest about it, we are the church. You are the church. This is not pointing to anybody. It's us. It's the church throughout its journey in history. And even now, it's guilty of its own forms of of injustice. They are Christians, people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of their souls, but they are racist. People who are Christians, who believe in Jesus for the salvation of their souls. But they cannot find it in their hearts to care about people who are less fortunate than they, right? They ignore those. They ignore people who they see as less than them, beneath them, like, 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 like the priest and the Levite who, who walked right by 
the man on the road who was um, who was wounded by thieves, right? In the story of the Good Samaritan, and that they are that they are they are Christians who's who who have entered into immoral spaces in their life's journey. They believe in Jesus for the salvation of their soul, but they but they're not in the right. But, but they're not walking in the right place with God. But they are believers. You see, the thing, the, 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 the truth is that we all need to repent. That the guilt of the early church in, in, in terms of their shortcomings, in terms of what they were dealing with from the apostles all the way to the other believers and the, the, the church today and what is being dealt with within our church. Even what's going on in our country right now, there are churches who are involved in this, in carrying the guilt of racism in this country. And what happens is, we, we have our spiritual routines, we have our spiritual practices and that, that, that creates for us a feeling of connectedness with God when God is calling us to repent of these things. And what it does is creates a dead religion. We serve a living God, but our experiences like this, when we are in these conditions, it creates a dead religion, leaving us acting like a bunch of self-righteous sinners. But what the Spirit of God wants to do instead is to create in us a vibrant and living faith. Well, I tell you, listen, this is why sometimes those who are, who are not a part of the church or who may not have a, a spiritual belief or a Christian belief, they would look at churches, they would look at some church leaders of whom they know things about, and they would say, man, these people are hypocrites. Or these, or, or these, the, these people feel that that, that they can say what they want and have no obligation to try and live it out. Yes, it, it's, it's, it is that, it, it is those elements from the early church all the way to today that the Spirit of God continues to work with and to work on. He's here to help us with all of this. You see, it is impossible to consistently and effectively live the Christian life without the ongoing enabling power of the Holy Spirit. It is further challenging when we try to do it together as a community of believers, each one with his or her own ways, his or her own personalities. And if the truth be told, you know, some personalities rub you the wrong way and you have a problem with it. And guess what? The problem might be the personality and the problem might also be your personality. And how we deal with those things, right? We have each have our own ambitions, our own insecurities. Yeah, they're insecurities. People come in with all kinds of insecurities, needs, traumas, sensitivities, weaknesses, and strengths. All of this exists. It was there in that upper room with 120 persons, and it's in our churches today. You see, friends, we must pray. Just like they did in that upper room, and the Spirit of God descended upon them, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that makes this thing work. And he's not, even as we look at the injustices that's going on now, it's good to protest, and we can and should when we can protest. But we must pray. Don't protest and not pray. And some can and some do, but what I'm saying is as the church, if you're going to protest, let's also pray. Right? The church must pray and we must pray together. Why? Because prayer invites God's intervention. And I want to just, just, just conclude with this final thought here. Prayer invites God's intervention, right? Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Psalm 33, verses 16 through 22. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope 
for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. That posture of reliance upon God is best expressed through prayer, and it is acquired and maintained through prayerful dependence. Prayer becomes a necessary part of cultivating this quality in our Hearts, lest we think we can stand on our own and handle things on our own and do it on our own. You see, we can get so far, right? We can get so far, but unless the Lord is building his house, they labor in vain who build it. So you need the builders, you need the laborers, you need those who are doing the work, who are on the front lines, who are at it day in and day out. But you must invite God alongside their efforts. I tell you. This is why even through this pandemic, we could not stop praying. We have to keep praying for our first responders, for our healthcare workers, for our essential workers, and all those involved in that, right? So that their efforts can gain deeper traction because we are inviting God's intervention. We are inviting God's presence into the crisis. Because unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It means that you need God watching as well as, in addition to. All right? And even in the army, it says here that it's not the strength of your, of your military. It's not the strength of your, of, your, of your horses at that time. As you know, that's what primarily the military was made, of, made up of. But it is your reliance on God as a nation thank God for the for the wonderful military that we have and 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 and, and all of our veterans who are um, with us and those who have gone on made the ultimate sacrifice so grateful so grateful but it's so important for us to invite God's wisdom to invite God's intervention to invite God's presence in all these areas of society in what we are building in what we are protecting, and in the fights that we must engage. This battle that goes on right now in our nation, we must invite God in. And, and we are, and we are praying, and we are doing that. But I'm just reminding us how important God's participation and that collaborative work between us and the Spirit is. It's not just about our rituals. But it's about thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, church. Come on, church. Collaborative work with God is a part of our responsibility to bring God in. Through prayer. Through prayer. As we work. I want to take a moment to pray. And I know that um, if you have a prayer request, you know that you can send it in at prayer at wakeeden.org. You can do that right now. We have a prayer team. They're going to look at those requests, and they're going to be praying for those requests uh, throughout the course of the week. So you can send your prayer requests to that. Uh, it's right at the bottom of the screen anytime, right now or, or even later. You can just send in your prayer request. But I want to pray for, you, for us right now. We're going through a lot in our societies, in our cities. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we just lift before you the tragic circumstances in which we find ourselves as a country. Not just our health crisis, Lord. Not the global pandemic, Lord. Not just that, God. But, but Lord, the, the unrest, the civil unrest that has emerged, God, out of the injustices that we have seen and the loss of black lives. Father, we pray that you will help us, that you will give us strength, that you will speak to the powers that be, that practices will change, that the system 
the system that should work for all, that those who are in those positions of power and authority to make it work for all, that they will make those right decisions, Lord. Or that, Father, you will see to it that those who would would take those places. If you have, if you feel the convicting work of the Holy Spirit and you, if you have to make a decision today and you feel that sense of urgency to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you repeat these words after me? Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now I surrender my life to you, Jesus. And I ask, Lord, that you will cleanse me and forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior, I pray. In your holy name, Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> If you prayed that prayer, uh, we would love to be in touch with you. Uh, would you send in your, your name or just, just email us and let us know that you've made uh, that decision. We would love to be in touch with you. If you would like us to do that, just send us an email at prayer at wakeeden.org. It's right there at the bottom of your screen. Amen. 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 <clears throat> We do have a couple of announcements today. Um, the weekly prayer gatherings continue to take place on Mondays at 7 p.m. and Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. Mondays at 7 p.m. and Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. We call in and we pray we pray together. Uh, we will be praying for the social unrest and injustices, again, that we continue to experience uh, in our country uh, during this week. We will also continue to pray for our health care and hospital workers and those on the front lines and continue to pray for wisdom for our local <clears throat> state government and city governments as they look to slowly reopen uh, the state and the city and some of our uh, services, uh, retail, and so forth. Please remember, continue to be safe and practice um, uh, social distancing and just continue to be precautious, even in familiar uh, situations. Uh, please, just for our own health and safety. Our church family, um, as many of you know already, uh, about the passing of our dearly beloved brother Neville Peterson. We were shocked to learn that he passed on Tuesday night. Uh, you know, Brother Peterson uh, has been uh, such a faithful um, member of our church family. Uh, he, was, he was more than just someone who, who came to church and, and, and went home. Uh, after and, and we praise God for, for all those who, who do that. But Brother Peterson's commitment to the work of the ministry and to staying connected with people is something that was not only just evident to me, but so many have been telling me about how Brother Peterson has just really made a difference in their lives. He was our property manager. He was our dancing usher. He would lead the team of ushers every year, the ushers uh, concert. Uh, he would call me up all the time, call so many of us. Uh, we, we love Brother Peterson and we dearly miss him. And we, our hearts grieve uh, that he is no longer with us. But at some point that grief becomes uh, a moment where you recognize that, okay, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Brother Peterson is having the best time of his life right now. His wife preceded him a few months earlier, last October, and they are both in heaven now. And so, you know what? He, he couldn't be in a happier place or in a better experience. And so it is in that sense that we will celebrate his life, that he's lived his life 
for the glory of God. God has chosen to take him, allow him to come out of this world and into his presence at this time and in this way. And so the Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be your name, O God. We miss our brother. We love our brother, but we know he is with you. And we are grateful for the journey that you have given us with him. So church family, we will be celebrating Brother Peterson's life uh, on this coming Thursday. Again, it's a private family gathering, a private family funeral. Uh, so this is not for any public attendees. But what we will be doing is allowing us, allowing you to provide video tributes for Brother Peterson. So if you would like to give a video tribute, just a one minute video of this about, and just to say a few words, you can send your video to we care, we excuse me, we share at wakeeden.org. We share, S H A R E, at wakeeden.org. You can send your one minute videos there, and we will try to compile that into a video tribute in, in, um, in memory of our good brother Neville Peterson. Amen. At this time, church family, we have concluded our worship experience. I invite you to posture yourselves to receive the benediction. Glory to your name, O oh God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This concludes our service, church family. Have a safe and productive week. God bless you. See you soon. Take care.